best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, all right, all right. We are live. It is Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Show, and we have got my favorite John Jack in the whole wide world. Barely needs an introduction. My good friend, the one and only, super powerful Jack Pasobek. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing fantastic. And super congrats to you on everything you're doing with the podcast. You know, oh. I remember this is my second time, I think, officially on JML. Definitely. But I remember the first time it was just you and me like sitting down in a, you know, in a coffee shop in DC somewhere with a couple of microphones. That's right. I had and, the portable the, studio. I brought it yeah, to you, Jack. Thing. That was in, uh, I think that was in Adams Morgan. Yeah, that was a and while we were just back. just kind of going over also oh, it was a while it was years ago um now that we're that we're old and we've become veterans of the culture war and so um you know just it's been amazing watching you grow and have this become such a powerful arsenal of truth and discussion and conversations that otherwise you know would not be had and it's you know also having been along for the ride of you know watching everything that uh, antifa did specifically um you know, to you and uh, tried to ruin your life and destroy you and how they've only made you 10 times more powerful than you've ever been before. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Jack, and I appreciate your support along the way. And uh, if two people have actually lived out the Antifa experience here in the United States of America, besides the courthouse in Portland, I imagine you and I are right at the top of the list. Uh, you yourself oh, yeah. have been up in the mix. This is not something that we're talking about from an academic perspective. We've lived it. Uh, Jack, you know, since you're being so nice, I'm going to be nice to you too, man. I remember when we first met, uh, it was right around the time uh, of the P Deplora Ball in 2017. And uh, you were you were powerful then, but man, you have only really just exploded and you are a absolute force of nature. So congratulations to you, Jack. It's been a pleasure seeing you grow and basically just take over the universe. So keep it up, buddy. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you coming back. Thank you so much, comrade. Shasha and that. I don't know. That's all I got. That's all I got is thank you, right? Shasha, so thank you. I think that's all I got. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, man. So let's get into it, dude. First of all, I want to know, I want a personal update. We didn't talk about this pre-show, but I want to know what's going uh -oh. on, man. I want to know, you are now working with one of our mutual, very good friends, Will Chamberlain as well, at yeah, Human Events. Right. And right. I, you know, Will and I go way back as well. The three of us have known each other for a number of years. People out there, when it looks like there's like a group of friends that are doing Twitter together in coordination, guess what? It's true, actually. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Jack and Will and I have all well, known each take, other. We take what's... You know, if people think that's woke, they should see what's in our uh, our group chats <laughs> or in the private conversations. Wait, oh, take that out. Edit that out. This right? is live, right? It's not live. Don't worry about it. Uh, tell me, man, how talk me through OAN to human events. I want to know. The world wants to know. How did you end up as a senior editor? Congratulations, by oh, the way, man. at you're, human you're, events. You're asking for the. You want the real nitty gritty behind the scenes. Well, no, to be honest, um, you know, and I, and I think this reflected itself in the way we did the announcement. Um, and I really, one thing that was really important to me is that I didn't want anyone to think that there was any bad blood between me and anybody in either of these situations. It was literally just, they offered me a, a fantastic position at human events. Um, they wanted to have someone come in and really kind of have the nose to the grindstone on a day to day basis in terms of the news, the investigations that are going on there and the reporting. And it gave me a and, you know, coming from where I was at One American News, uh, it was more of a correspondent role. And so to be able to go from that to a position of leadership where at human events, you know, it's not necessarily a you know, you couldn't call it a startup because the thing's been around since 1944. But this, I, I kind of jokingly call it a restart up, right? Because it, it had been a magazine, of course, all the way through the 40s up until the 80s, 90s. Um, and then as things sort of moved into the digital age, um, people kind of moved away from it. Now we're taking the brand and we're bringing it back in a digital way. 
and really punching way be, you know above our weight class. But the reason for that is that so we've got the legacy, the incredible legacy of this. I mean, this was the paper that uh, they would walk into the Reagan administration and put down on the on the resolute desk when he was there. But then, of course, um, George Bush, the father, right, George Bush, uh, Poppy Bush, would always be trying to get it out of there because he's coming from the more neoconservative uh, northeast limousine liberal or excuse me limousine republican kind of set where rockefeller republican where he's trying to you know he's like don't don't read that you know conservative movement it's too populist get it out of here we don't we don't want anybody reading that stuff you know don't 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 let them read human events and reagan would turn around and go where's my human events i want my human events right now you know and so I love that legacy for it. You know, this is the paper that the establishment doesn't want you to read. And um, something that, you know, I actually haven't even said this publicly yet, but since we're on here, and I know that we talk about culture a lot and that it's something you guys talk a lot about on this podcast, we are actually looking to, um, and, you know, this is totally in just the pre planning stages right now, but we are actually looking to return to print um, and return to an actual copy of. The human events magazine maybe it's a monthly thing maybe it's a quarterly thing we have to figure it out but something that'll be for you know subscribers only but we're going to make it really nice we're going to put exclusive information in there we're going to have artwork we're going to really blow out you know what you see on the covers we want it made from good quality like cardstock um covers and something that you could have and it's like wow you know really display and show people that you have it um you know put on your coffee table whatever it is and I think that that's some, I think there's a space for that because even though the, you know, the information war, as Marshall McLuhan said, World War III will be a guerrilla information war. And in 1970, he said that that's how far ahead McLuhan was. And he was completely right. But that being said, I think there's space for a smaller zone of information a smaller zone of communication there's circles there are people who want to go deeper on certain issues there's people who want to go deeper on you know sort of long form obviously discussions like we're having right now and i think there's a print space for that too you know it's like the inner like think of an airplane situation right you know i fly a lot even during the pandemic i was flying all over the place um going to seattle etc and the internet just still doesn't really work very well on airplanes. It just it just doesn't, right? We'll get there. Maybe maybe Elon Musk and uh, and Starlink will do it for us, but I'm still not sold on it. <laughs> and you know, something that when you're on an airplane, there's something really nice about just having a print piece of material that's with you that's easy to read. You don't have to power it up. They're not going to give you crap about having it on when you take off and take you know take off and land, which of course is not you know obviously not that, that big of a deal. It's always taken out of proportion, but I think it's something that a lot of people are going to want physically have in their hands. And, you know, it's also even with the process of doing this book. Um, so we just released the Antifa book. It's just, you know, five years of my life, basically the research and my own experiences, my lived experiences, right? There That's what I was supposed to say. There's no data anymore. It's all lived experiences. And um, <laughs> it's interesting because there are some people who say, hey, I want to, I want this in Kindle. I want to read it on my phone. I don't, I don't do paper books anymore versus people who go, I want, I want something in my hands. I want a cover. I want a back. I want a dust jacket, whatever it is. And then of course you get the group of people who like myself actually, who say, I want an audio book. I I'm, you know, give it to me on audio. I want to be able to do something else while I'm uh, you know, while I'm on this, I want to be multitasking, even, even right now, right. You know, I've got like three or four tabs open. I'm involved in like three or four different dramas on, uh, you know, online somewhere, some kind of controversies going on. Don't tell and me my that. name's coming up, of course. And so, you know, that constant ability of multitasking in the world that we live in, but then also, you know, it's something where I like being able to listen to it, where, you know, if I'm just on a drive in the car or if I'm working out or, um, you know, I'd like to be able to turn it off and then I, boom, I can just go right back to spending time with my kids or whatever it is to make sure I'm scheduling time with them as well. So, um, I don't know if that really answered all of it your It did a little bit. I did that, I did that very, po very DC politician kind of trick where I started answering your question and then I started talking about my book. Yeah. You totally <laughs> pivoted. That was <laughs> excellent. Right in. It's almost and as if you're a professional. To, the reason I'm able 
to do that so well is not only because of my years of training and experience, but it's because I'm so well rested. And the way to be well rested is to get the best night's sleep in the whole wide world at mypillow.com with promo code. So, you know <laughs> I have been so proud you. of you with that, man. Every single time. I love it. I love you, how you, you slide it coming in up. There. No, but it was, um, you know, it's also, so getting back to the story, you know, when I went to One American News, I said, look, you know, I, I think we've done a lot of great work together. I've always appreciated. They've always had my back um, in any time somebody from the left or the mainstream or the establishment was coming after me. Like the World Economic Forum just came after me by name recently. Like, why am I on their list? It's Klaus, Klaus Schwab. Right. He's like, he's got the most like uh, Bond villain voice. <laughs> Klaus Schwab. Yes. Yes. American. You will be served. You will own nothing. The neo feudal overlords will take over. But Mr. Posobic is in my way. I'm like, really? <laughs> um, so they're, yeah, they've been tweeting about me lately. And, uh, but one American news always had my back during any of those things or any time one of these like sort of hackneyed, you know, they call themselves disinformation reporters, but they're actually disinformation pushers. And they are sort of the chief scribes and um, propagandists of the new regime. And that's what we're going through right now in America. We are, and it feels like that, right? And so we should start calling it that. We are going through a regime change here in the United States. Uh, and in many ways, this has been going on in a soft, uh, in a soft capacity for a long time, but it's, it's, it's now come out and it's shown its face. It has been completely exposed. And so we're going to have to wrestle with that. Where do we want to continue to go as a country? And, uh, you know, so for me, when I went to, you know, the leadership and told them, I said, look, you know, I, for me, I look at this as a career move. I look at it from going from a point where, Hey, I'm, I'm one of the correspondents here, but over there, they want to make me an, an editor. And, you know, I want to give that a shot. I think it's at that. And I'd done three and a half years already at One American News. So that was a pretty good chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And they completely understood. And they said, well, you know what? Let's, let's, you know, keep the doors open. Let's keep the lines of communication open. I've actually gone on a couple of times since then uh, for interviews here and there. And uh, we still want to collaborate on stories. You know, hey, if I'm breaking something, boom, send it over to them. They can cover it. And so there's a mutual um you know there's a mutual relationship there but then of course it also lets me to have that relationship with other podcasts such as this being able to go on uh different shows going on different networks and just really kind of expand out from uh from where i was yeah well congratulations on that congratulations to human events as well i'm really proud and happy to see you guys coming together seeing will and jack come together i know the future is going to be right be very bright i know that will's a very smart guy and he's motivated and you guys are are getting set up just like all i'm noticing all the pieces are put it being set on the board for 2022 but really for 2024 right yeah. like like i yeah. we're, i'm discovering that well, 22 the, is the test run and then 24 yeah. it's game time that's right uh tw the presidential elections are like the super bowl for the media and it, or it's like the olympics right they come every four years people train for it get set up get put into the right position build their teams and then boom you know the election starts and it's a full court press when all the ratings and views yep. and everything double and triple even and uh, it's interesting to see all the places being said on the board right now, a number of different places. So uh, I can see the uh, the, the squads forming uh, for 2024, and you guys are in a very strong place. Now let's talk about the book. Uh, I've got it right here, The Antifa, Stories from Inside the Black Block by Jack Posobiec, now available at www.antifabook.com. And when you're done with that, head over to uh, mypillow.com, promo code POSO, and pick up uh, some of those stuff right there. I'm trying. I'm not as smooth as you. They say the best way to read the book is when you're lying on a MyPillow. That's, I mean, that's that's what they say. That's what they yes. tell me. Perfect. Now, writing this book, Jack, These are this is you. This is your life. This is what you were involved in. You, you've recorded the last five years when you were doing when you were doing the book did you come to any new revelations was there something that stood out to you that that maybe we hadn't realized in our day-to-day -day engagement with antifa whether it was face to face online all over the place all over the country was there something that you learned you did doing this book that gave you is giving you any new insights into into how to manage this menace this domestic international terrorist group well, you know actually. it's it's interesting because a lot of people said they and even my publishers at one point and um harry stein from uh city's the associate editor at city journal he came in and served as the editor for the book so i'm really grateful to him and uh, he's got his own book coming out as well right now from calamo but 
one thing that we wrestled with was how much history do we want to put in? Do we want it to be all history or, you know, do we want it to just be current events? And I'm going through like the open court cases and stuff that's going on just in those five years. And I argued for putting the history in because I think what's one thing that's very interesting about this is that Antifa seems to happen in cycles. And it seems to happen in waves. Um, so we see this in the early, you know, the early 1900s, late 1800s, uh, the assassination of McKinley. We then see in the 1920s, 1930s in, in Weimar, Germany. Uh, we see this in then the 60s, 70s and 80s, again, in West Germany with the rise of the Red Army faction. They're funded by the Stasi and the KGB. They're involved with the, the PLO, the Palestinians. Then they go kind of dormant for a while. They pop up again. 1999 Battle of Seattle, they're anti-China, based, by the way, at the, at the Battle of Seattle. They're arguing right. against, they're protesting against the WTO and China's ascension. Fast forward 2011, right? 2011, boom, Occupy Wall Street, Zuccotti Park, 99%, 1%, we all remember it. Then you fast forward to now, and they're back, but it seems as though they've kind of lost their original roots, and they've almost been co-opted by this new ideology that's being pushed by it you know at first some you know just closeted smaller sectors of uh, academia harvard princeton and others but now has burst onto the stage in terms of mainstream america and that is your critical race theory that is your neo-marxism that's your your social justice your racial justice all of this stuff has just blown, uh, absolutely blown sky high, right? Through the roof onto the American scene. The American system does not know how to deal with it, doesn't know how to handle it. And it's this huge struggle now between sort of the morals of the past, traditional American morals, traditional Western morals, and this new type of moral formation that's being pushed by these. And so Antifa though, interestingly, Ha, of the you know the current age the modern age has moved away from that economic question and they're talking about culture questions they're talking about racial questions identity questions social questions however what's interesting is that they're actually being driven by economic factors only this time around instead of being used by the Soviet Union, instead of being used by uh, the KGB, they're being co-opted by who? Corporate America, woke academia, the forces of the new regime. And so it's very, very interesting. It's quite nefarious. Uh, and I call the sort of um, hodgepodge of groups that are behind them, uh, this cornucopia of corruption, to just sort of cut across that for people. And so that folks know that they are not fighting the system anymore. Antifa today are the shock troops of mm -hmm. the system. Indeed, they are. And in the past, subcultures that get co-opted by the corporate structure tend to be on their last legs. That is the moment at which you know that an underground phenomenon that had a lot of cool fact, not that Antifa is cool, but just the way the co-option process usually works. Underground phenomenon, it's cool. It starts to trickle up and then it goes a little bit. And then the corporations finally get it. They co-opt it. They own it. And then it's dead. And then it's dead. But that's well, not like punk music. Like it's like punk music and the trajectory of Billy Joe Armstrong and Green Day's career, right? <laughs> yeah, you right. know, they they burst onto the scene um, with their first two albums. What is it, Kerplunk and uh, Thousand One Stoned Out Smoky Hours? And then are they backwards? Kerplunk was second, and then they're and they're just totally punk, just in the streets. Boom! They go to Dookie, they go to Longview, uh, Nimrod, and then suddenly they just become more and more corporate to the point where. It's 2004 and they're performing for, and Dave Grohl did this too, by the way, um, obviously famous from, you know, being the drummer Nirvana, the Foo Fighters, you know, and they're performing at the DNC or, you know, going on shows with John Kerry, who's an elected politician, you know, elected, um, they're trying to be an elected politician, he's a senator. And I remember actually, you know, looking at that saying, what's going on? Like, I thought you guys were musicians. Why are you? getting into this stuff why are you going so corporate and i remember you know fast forward a little bit but do you remember the juggalo march that happened uh in dc a couple of years ago yeah 
Yeah, so I go to the Juggalo March, that's the St. Clown Posse, and they were actually protesting, right, the FBI, because the FBI was trying to label them like a hate group and label them a criminal gang and all this other stuff. And I thought it was really interesting because, hey, here's a, a subculture that's protesting the FBI, but they really haven't allowed themselves to be corporatized or being taken over from that. And that's because of their sort of top down approach to things uh, in terms of the way they kind of govern all that. And it was really interesting to me because Antifa actually shows up there and they start trying to recruit people. And and at first the juggalo was like, whatever, whatever, you're just marching with us. But then Antifa was out there in force. It's this DC Antifa, then a bunch of personalities that I'm sure you remember. Mm. And and then as it got throughout the day, Antifa actually got thrown out by the juggalos because they kept trying to politicize things. And the jug and the Antifa kept saying, Well, you know, we just hate Trump so much. We we hate him. He's terrible, he's awful. And the juggalos would turn around and say, No, you don't understand. From our perspective, it's F all politicians and all politics like we we don't want to play your little games so if you're going to be like that get out get out uh we had a very interesting super chat already from eliza right now she says how do you expect antifa to upgrade this summer what is going to be different are they going to have different tactics are they going to take a different approach and she says something about today's sentencing of derek chauvin is that right is that happening today it is uh, suspected to happen today in in Minneapolis. So they did announce already that the judge, as as to be expected, um, did reject his uh, plea for a, a retrial. Uh, one of the stories that I broke um, while I was still at One American News was that this juror um, who came out publicly during the trial was giving interviews from everyone to the Wall Street Journal to NBC actually had not on his Facebook page, but on his uncle's Facebook page, his uncle had posted a photo of him attending, we were just talking about marches in DC, attending not only the George Floyd march um, that was held by Al Sharpton, but he's got a George Floyd shirt on, he's got a George Floyd hat on, um, and he's out there protesting against all the stuff George Floyd's brother is speaking at the event. So he lied all over his jury form. Now, the judge in that in that case, people say, well, hold on. That's that's obviously a grossly biased jury. You can't have. And if one person on there has that bias, he's hidden it. Uh, he's gotten all the way up. You know, how do we how do we allow this to go on? Right. But the judge also lives in the real world. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't get that you can't just go off of the letter of the law. You have to understand which way the winds are blowing. And I remember your appearance on Tim Pool following January 6, which you know you also kind of alluded to the same time. You have to know you have to know what point of the movie you're in, folks. You have to know where you are. You have to know how things are going to go over. So that judge, look, he has a career ahead of him. He knows that people are looking at him. He wants to get on to the next rung up the corporate ladder, so to speak, in terms of the, of the you know the judicial world. So he wants to go up to be on the appellate court, maybe get on Supreme Court of Minnesota, whatever it is. So he's not going to admit that he did something wrong because it's going to gum up the works of the way things are moving in the machine, the way things are moving in the system. And Alan Dershowitz actually brought this up on court TV weeks ago, where he said, because this case has been so politicized and that our country has become so politicized that he doesn't think that any of the appeals, those will move now to appeal process, that any of those appeals will be heard until you get to the Supreme Court because of the careerism aspect of this and because of the over politicization of this case that maybe, maybe the Supreme Court will be the only, you know, the only wrong, the, the highest tier of our judiciary in the country where you may be able to find some modicum of relief. Hmm. Well, that's going to be some time before they get to that. And in the meantime, Antifa is going to be still doing their thing. We saw but they have last, a free hand right now. They have yeah. an absolute free hand. So we saw last summer, we saw the escalation from the streets. We saw the escalation in, in, uh, in Portland. And especially we saw the escalation with their coordinated assassination. Uh, of Jay in there yeah. in in, uh, in the end of the summer last year. And that was a real scary moment 
seeing the way that their team operated in the street together, people in front of the target, people behind the target, moving ahead and around them, having people look out, having people filming it. It was terrifying to see a coordinated assassination in the street like that. So when what I, can we when expect I moving about, forward, man? When I talk about this and I talk about the planning that we see in terms of the black blocks and the planning that I witnessed when I was infiltrating the groups in DC all the way back in 2016 to the more sophistication that we now see in the streets, when it comes to a city like Portland, where those individuals were able to be out there night after night after night, right? They're learning best practices. Every time you um, every time you effectively defeat right your opponent, you are revealing a capability, you are revealing a strategy. And that's not just with you know policing, that's that's life, right? So you're revealing a strategy. So because they've gone up against Portland police, they because they've gone up uh, against the citizens of Portland, the people of Portland for so long and been allowed to get away with it. Right. We're now learning more about why that was. I talk about that in my book. Now there's new reports coming out that General Milley actually allowed Antifa and these groups to continue their violence across the United States for their for all of 2020, that because they're learning, they're able to then evolve their tactics. And we call these tactics, techniques, and procedures. So you look at Antifa from 2016, they're they're much less sophisticated. They understand some of the but they already had the groups. They had the hierarchy of a black block. They knew um, milkshaking is a great example of this because people think, right, it's, it sounds silly even when you say it. Or, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to milkshake someone. I'm going to throw a milkshake in their face and post it on Twitter. But here's the thing. That's a coordinated assault because one person throws the milkshake. That is designed to blind the opponent. And it's and by using milkshakes, and you can get, by the way, media matters, and again, these sort of like uh, disinformation harpies will swarm around and say, oh, it's just milkshakes. Oh, it's just milkshakes. It's totally innocuous. You can't ban milkshakes. What does that do? That blinds your opponent. Then from the next moment on, you've got three or four guys who are able to rush in, punch, pound, assault, kick, whatever it is, steal uh, equipment, steal cameras from the asset, from the person who's, who's the target. And then the rest are outside with umbrellas, with signs. They're blocking this from view. They're blocking the ability for, um, even if it's overhead cameras or people on the side with cameras to understand what's really going on. That's why when you see people who've been assaulted in places like Portland, it is so hard to bring charges against them because they are using advanced insurgent tactics against their targets insurgents they were insurgents now they are the shock troops of the establishment and it's very important i think for people to understand that we are actually experiencing an occupation by a hostile outside force using their ideology to take over our establishment and people like us we're actually <clears throat> we're actually the insurgents uh, although you don't want to use that word too much, especially so around here's here's January the thing. Now we're the dissidents, right? We're we the, we're the, the freedom fighting dissidents. We're the Wolverines, man. Wolverines, and we've literally got Emilius on our side. Of course, we're the Wolverines. Of course. <laughs> Which, by the way, we're going to be doing um, the showing of Plot Against the President here in D.C. Uh, actually, in McLean next week on the thirtieth. So it's going to be really good. I'm hosting. Love to have you if you're around. I'll definitely um, be there. But we're going to be doing um, trying to get Lee Smith up. We've got a couple congressmen coming. Cash Patel, who plays, of course, a huge role in the film, will be there. Amanda Milius will be there. I'm putting out all the information on that. And believe it or not, that's actually still up on Amazon. They haven't been able to cancel it yet. <laughs> but no, the next evolution of Antifa, by the way, is going to be in terms of their targets. Look, Antifa knows that they, they, they on a subconscious level, on a um you know in in sort of the the super ego of antifa they understand that they are or they believe that they are the true warriors of justice and righteousness fighting against the targets of evil the forces of evil and so what they're doing is they're waiting to use these swarm tactics against a localized entity of evil a locus of evil if you will and so if you look at those loci it's, it's not Donald Trump anymore because he's off the stage. It's not Trump supporters because you don't see them organizing or uh, holding rallies in, in any significant feature, though we may see that this weekend with the return of Trump to, uh, I believe he's going to Ohio this weekend, Cleveland area. 
But you look at what's going on. They're going after teachers now. They're going after parents, places like Loudoun County, Fairfax County, where if you don't believe in the new regime's agenda that's being indoctrinated to your children, well, they're going to go after you and the teachers will post your address. They'll post your phone number, you know, and we did the Antifa documentary last year and Libby Emmons, who we interviewed for it. She's the editor in chief of Post Millennial. She pointed out that in one of the videos, I think it was New York City, they had people marching past somebody's house and they knew it was somebody's house, right? And they were calling up and they were saying, Michaela, Michaela, come join us, come join us, right? You have to join us. So in the new morality, if you don't join, you're part of the problem. And I say new, mm -hmm. but this is not new because we've seen this in the Chinese cultural revolution. We've seen this in the Bolshevik revolution, this idea that if you are not of the revolution, if you are not of the new regime, then you are an enemy. And when you look at those photos, right, of the struggle sessions from the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and they were forced to wear the signs across their neck, and they're paraded in front of stadiums, um, and got their you know their arms tied behind them, and pulled back. Sometimes they they were allowed to live, sometimes not. But many of the times, do you know what's actually written in Chinese on their uh, on those signs? Mm -mm. No, sir. What is it? Right wing extremist. Get it out says right wing extremist. Right. That's the exact same label that we saw in at the height of Mao's terror and his purges a time a decade where people would, in many cases, commit suicide after they'd been targeted rather than face that kind of mob justice because they knew what was happening would be 10 times worse. I think you made a really good point here uh, uh, indirectly, which is that the the CRT woke folks, they are adopting Antifa tactics, whether they may be conscious of, uh, of it or not. I suspect that they're being educated. They have overlapping groups. This, these teachers in Loudoun County, et cetera, unless you've got evidence that Antifa is directly involved, it seems to me that they uh, are adopting these tactics, these same strategies. You remember uh, in DC when uh, this last summer when Antifa would just, and BLM would just march around up and down commercial strips, walk into mm -hmm. outdoor eating areas, up onto tables with like 50 people people pointing and screaming at individuals who are just having dinner and forcing them to say the words, forcing them to say, Jack, they did that to me once. They did that to me once. There was a time where a kid stole a car or something and he rode off and he got hit by another car and they blamed it on the cops. And they were protesting right by my house. I had heard the helicopter flying overhead, so I went to go investigate. I come across 30 or 40 of these guys. I'm the only one out there. And uh, they forced me. They were trying to force me into saying the words. Are you with us? Are you against it? Who are you with? Who are you with? Do you believe? Are you with blah, blah, blah. Black Lives Matter. Say it. And I couldn't, of course, and I wasn't. And I definitely wasn't going to do it. But I could feel it in my in my soul, like... You know, I was definitely not going to say it, but like I could say, I could see if I did, like what kind of a soul destroying moment that would be to just come out right. and, 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 and make an affirmation against something that you, you know, is evil and wrong. And, and, and what you see going on there is the same as any other type of occupying force throughout history. It is, we are in charge and you will swear fealty to us. Whether you believe it or not makes no difference because you will acquiesce to our authority or you will be the victim of our authority. You will be the target of our authority in terms of force. Whether the, And now whether that force is physical violence or it's unpersoning, it's having your rep, it's reputation assassination, it's uh, being able to destroy you from uh, your your bank accounts, your payment processors, your job, you won't be able to hold it anymore. Uh, or in the case of many of these people who are involved, who were peacefully, you know, involved in the January 6th Capitol riot, where, you know, you've got this guy, a Vietnam vet recently, who was just arrested yesterday. And he said, look, I, I spoke to the police and they, they opened the door and said it was okay to go in. I just wanted to use the bathroom. And he's right. getting arrested in front of his grandkids. Right. And they just sentenced somebody either yesterday, or today, the first Which one, people need to grandma. understand that those those targets that the FBI is putting together are being handed to them by Antifa cells. OK, right. You see these people out there. They call themselves the insurrection hunters. This is a digital Antifa cell that has been created to go through and commit 
and take those tactics of doxing, take those tactics of uh, being able to target somebody, find out everything about their life, and then turn it over. Now the FBI is working hand in hand with the people who call themselves this Antifa cell of insurrection hunters, taking their information and going out and conducting raids, right? Where in many cases, it, or the, certainly the case of um, this couple up in Alaska, it's not even the right person or the person involved wasn't involved in anything violent or themselves. They just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, which is something I said on the day of January 6th, as I was standing on the roof, you know where our building is in DC, I'm standing on the roof of that building, 101 Constitution, looking across and I'm saying, you know, the people that are coming up behind the very front are going to have no clue what's going on here. They're going to get wrapped up in this and they're going to walk in because they see the doors open and it, it is nominally a public building, right, that's open on a regular basis. They're going to think that they are on a tour. And so that is being used against them by these cells of the insurrection hunters to go after people, these, you know, grandmothers of five and Vietnam vets who, you know, are getting getting on, getting advanced in years, right? The entire narrative is blown up and everybody can see that the narrative is false, that we've been told about that, but it doesn't matter because again, acquiescence to the narrative means that you are swearing allegiance, you are swearing fealty to the new regime. They've become linked in a parallel symmetrical structure now where if you say there was an insurrection on January 6th, it means you are someone who has been fully subsumed by the new regime and by their new moral framework. A hundred percent. Now, give me give me a couple minutes here, because, Jack, I got a lot to cover. First of all, man, you and me, we were supposed to be together on January 6th. You and I were texting and calling each other. We were supposed to meet yeah, up and go right. to the Trump speech together, but we couldn't coordinate. And then we coordinated after the speech. I was like, dude, it's not right. It's not good. And I bailed after the speech. It was just I just did not want to be there. You were down there on uh, Constitution Yeah, Avenue. there was a weird energy. There was, there was I, weird I bailed energy. early. I was out by like 8.30, 8.45. Yeah. We, we were supposed to be there together. Now, on this insurrection hunter thing, you and I, again. So if you brought this up to like Good Morning America or whatever, they would laugh at you and be like, this is an absolute joke. But because we're talking, I can tell you and you know from personal experience, after a night for freedom... In 2018, that picture of you and me and Chelsea and Cassandra and Will Chamberlain surfaced from uh, after uh, we did the uh, escape room. And Antifa posted that picture. They're like, look at these fascists that Chelsea Manning is hanging out with. And, and above each person, they numbered each person. And they put everybody's name at, on top. They put Jack Posobiec, they put Will Chamberlain, Cassandra Fairbanks. But then there was me and my girlfriend. My yeah, my, my, my wife, couldn't be wife now, my fiancé. Right, right, your fiancé is in there. And there was two question marks above our heads, and they figured it out, ma'am. They figured it out. They did some whatever internet genius work. They figured out who I was. They figured out my pen name. They figured out my real name. They figured out where I worked, and then they swarmed and attacked me on social media, got me docs fired, and kicked me out of my old career and into this new one, which is an irony into itself. But the point is, is that these tactics have been in use four years, these teams of people training on this stuff. And you and I were actually part of the way that they've refined these tactics. And now they're using them on January, on the January six people. It's going to keep evolving. It's going, they're iterating, they're iterating. Right, and and in this, is that yes. not, it's going to go beyond January six, January six just gives them Kidding. a target rich environment, but yeah. you wait once that has been depleted. Do you think this, do you think the people who will come up with these tools are just going to walk away? It's like the military industrial complex, right? They are going to find a new villain to fight. They are all, there always has to be, you know, a Eurasia that we, you know, we've always been at war with Eurasia, right? So they're going to find, Oh, here's this father who said something wrong at a school meeting or here's a guy who said something on a, in a boardroom we've got to go after him or here's a 14 year old kid on TikTok who's saying something stupid or here's someone who had said something stupid on TikTok, uh you know years and years ago whatever it is right find them track them down trace them destroy their lives these are the tactics that are being done by these cells these cells and, and nobody cares right not only does nobody care that 
the FBI is now working hand in hand with these people who's declared their declared goal, their declared end state is the eradication of their political opponents. It's terrifying to think that because we do know that Christopher Ray said specifically it's been reiterated. Then Joe Biden said it in a joint his first address of joint session of Congress. He said that white nationalism is the biggest threat that we face in the United States of America. I asked Cash Patel point blank someone who was the National Security Council top advisor for counterterrorism and the chief of staff of the Secretary of Defense. I asked him point blank, do you have any evidence that white nationalism and white nationalism terror is the number one domestic threat facing the United States? What was his answer? It was an unequivocal no, no. But yet the FBI director and now our top generals in the military as well. So we're going to get to Millie here in a second. They believe Remember, this we've to... always been at war with East Asia. <laughs> always been at war with East they Asia. They believe this to be true. And now they can see, I guess they see Antifa as what? Patriots? Antifa are now actual patriots trying to save the establishment, trying to save our government by helping them dox these people. I mean, is that the mindset now of our top military leaders and all of our institutions that they see Antifa as a as as a as a, an aligned group to protect the United States of America when we know that their state so, goal is so to destroy the whole thing? What's, How what's stupid can they be? Is, is, it's a, it's a symptom of a broader. I don't know what that was, but that was funny. I don't know what that was either. <laughs> Keep going. Um, there's, it's Live. a symptom of a broader, a broader cancer that's going on in American culture, and this this does go back to the military industrial complex, where they've been out searching for targets for the last twenty years, uh, really the last thirty years, if you count the end of the Cold War. So, the Cold War ends, and it's kind of interesting, right? And James Paulus just had a piece up in mind about the where where he was talking about how, what's the point of the military in the new age, right? right? What's being in the military when some guy who's a politician can just press a button and defeat the enemy, right? So your, your power is diminished. Well, that created this situation where, because remember the military for thousands of years has been the symbol of power, right? The, you know, the, the politicians cannot do anything without the military. But when the nuclear bomb, 1945 happens, right? Hiroshima and Nagasaki, suddenly that power is transferred, right, in a very, very supernatural sense from the military to the civilian politicians. The military knows it. So ever since those bombs dropped, and this is this is Paulus's formation, which I think is interesting, the military has been trying to explain to us the justification for their existence. Mm -hmm. And so mutually assured destruction comes about. And then you, of course, remember the bomber gap uh, for people who are, who are old enough to remember the Cold War. We have to have as many bombers as they do. We can't have the bomber gap, right? Got to build, build, build more, more, more. But then the Soviet Union goes away. And so when the Soviet Union goes away, it's what do we do now? And if you look at the 1990s, so what do they do? They turn internally, Waco, Ruby Ridge. Um, that, of course, produces blowback. Then, of course, one thing that nobody remembers, though, 1993, the first World Trade Center bombing, right? Then fast forward 2011, the second World Trade Center attack, um, obviously 9-11. So that gives them a new target. Hey, we're going to go after, and remember, it wasn't just the overseas threat, right? Um, it wasn't just the threat of Al-Qaeda overseas, and we're going to go up, we're going to take care of this one group and be done with it. No, 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 no. It became Iraq, it became justification for a new invasion there. Then it also became this, this whole pervasive story about the sleeper cells in the United States. Um, and you saw propaganda shows just flow across American media and movies flow from Hollywood about this, none of which ever existed or amounted to anything. It would be like one or two guys maybe, and they commit a vehicular assault or... Um, they go and have some kind of rudimentary, um, you know, rudimentary uh, incendiary device that they've been able to build. And I don't, I'm not trying to downplay 
the fact that there was a real threat, but I'm talking about the overblowing of the threat. And at the same time, not being able to stop real threats like, for example, the Boston bombers uh, in, you know, at the Boston Marathon in 2013 in April, who were able to conduct a lot of travel and operationalization prior to that event with somehow no one being the wiser, right? You've got the older one going back and forth from Dagestan um, and seemingly not even being tripped up. There's also a murder of a Jewish family that they were, uh, a couple of brothers that they were involved in that, that in 2011 that nobody did anything about. And that threat, you know, that per the use of that pervasive threat justified their existence. But now it's gone, it's gotten to the point where it's completely untenable. And even Joe Biden and his people have said, look, it's, it's gone too far. And the China issue, well, China exists as a threat, but China is also an economic partner of America's elites, of Western elites, right? This is our where our manufacturing is done. They those are the uh the slave wage builders and the constructors and the assembly line workers of the People's Republic that are making our, you know, cheap big screen TVs and all now. And so they can't do too much against the military to justify any any type of action. So then where does the gaze turn? Where does the gaze of the military, industrial, national security, industrial complex turn? Well, it has to turn internally. And that is what we are seeing now from whether whether it's conscious or not, by the way, from Millie, from um, Christopher Ray, from everybody else. They have to justify their existence somehow. And what better way to do that than to claim that there is a domestic in, insurrection uh, an insurgency, a uh, a group of people that are founded by the by this extremist, as as the general put it, white rage, that he and only he understands, and that only his military and his leadership can defeat in order to save the United States of America. So again, he's created in his mind subconsciously a justification for his own existence, a justification for the amount of spending, the budgets, a justification for all of his life's work, uh, because this is a guy who doesn't have any anything you can look at otherwise. It's a, a true accomplishment. I mean, you look at Iraq, you look at Afghanistan, right? These these are not wins in any <laughs> in any shape or shape, manner, or form, right? I, I don't know how you could describe that as a win at all. The Taliban is immediately taking over Afghanistan again, but then again, the Taliban didn't actually commit 9/11. So you know, if they're not looking to attack us, they rejected our. Um, our years and years of democracy building there. So uh, again, not our country, right? Just not our country. So uh, Trump had that comment once when he said, look, I'm not the king of Syria. What do you want me to do about it? Right. And so it's, it's a complete reversion. They say, well, if you want us to look internally, fine, but they are going to look for American targets. And that is exactly what they're doing now. Man, the United States military has had a lot of practice rooting out insurgents. That's what we've been doing, maybe not successfully, but that's what we've been doing for the last 20 plus years in the Middle East. But let's not forget, you know, we have turned our own apparatus upon domestic actors in the past, in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and I wonder, they were effective, it seemed back then, maybe not effective enough at rooting out the communists in academia and the media. Makes you wonder about all of those hearings and stuff in the 50s and 60s at this point now. Um, but technology has evolved to a point and social media has evolved to a point now where how concerned are you that we have all handed over to them all of the intelligence they need to figure out through social media scouring and scraping and all kinds of you know network analysis of who exactly is doing anything whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but just like the intelligence that they want, that they can act on. Have we all just handed it over to them? Have we all just said, pulled down our pants basically and said, you can send the drone strike right here, CIA, if that's what you want? I mean, how concerned should people be about their public discussions, about their social media activity? How much of that is going to come back and bite people in the ass? Well, I, I would put it this way. I'd say don't don't have any discussion on an encrypted app or what you think is an encrypted uh, chat server, Discord, whatever it may be. Um, just don't have any one that you wouldn't have in public, mm -hmm. right? And, I, and I'd say that to everybody. Um, I know there was that sort of 
thing going on uh, yesterday on Twitter, you know, should you be anonymous? Should you not be anonymous? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very much someone, look, if, if you want to get out your political frustrations on social media, I, I understand the interest for that. I understand there's a huge id driving that. Um, but you also want to have a normie job and you want to have the house and the wife and the kids, right? Ha stay anonymous. I would just say that stay, stay as anonymous as possible. Don't post anything that could connect you, you know, connect back to yourself. And by the way, obviously, if you're posting something that's, you know, like violent, just, you know, just you know, don't do that. But, you know, there will be people who target you for your comments. There will be people who target you for your jokes, for your memes, things you say in jest, whatever it may be. And they will try to ruin your life because I've said before, these forces are always looking for targets and they've erected a new type of false reality, right? Where they are fighting illusory phantoms of uh, white rage, as General Milley called it. They are fighting um, uh, Russian agents, right? And by the way, the reason for the Russian supposed influence network, the tie, the reason they are constantly trying to tie uh, domestic populism to some sort of international Russian conspiracy is because then that gives the national security state the authority to combat it as if it is a international threat, a foreign threat, rather than going after their own domestic internal enemies. This is why you see this part and parcel, and this is why in the movie Plot Against the President, uh, the entire Russiagate fiasco goes on, is because these tools are not intended to be used against political adversaries, but the loophole is if you can add in some type of foreign actor, some type of foreign agent, boom, it gets you there. And that's one thing that a lot of people say to me. They say, Jack, you know, is and I've seen uh, Eric Weinstein was posting about this recently. He said, well, I wonder if uh, the CCP and, and the People's Republic of China are behind wokeism and critical race theory and, you know, Antifa and all these different things. And I say, you know, Eric, it's it's no, they're not. They're, they're really not. This is domestic. It is coming from the West, it is being driven by white liberals and the intersectional left that are attempting to impose and are doing a very, very good job of imposing a new regime on the citizens, the individual citizens of the West. Now, that new regime is here. Right. And as you said, it's like uh, beginning to reveal itself and it's revealing itself, uh, especially in the military. Uh, the news that's been coming out has been terrifying i mean the 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 space force guy getting in trouble for just reading about the enemy and we've got general milley now who what, what did he tell stephen miller to shut the f up when miller was talking about the problems that we were having domestically in the united states the fires right. the arson i personally viewed a hundred or more felony incidents in one night Assaults on police officers, arson, people tearing things down, destroying. Like, it was real. It was happening. I can't believe that people were pretending that it wasn't happening. But, but think about that. Think about that. Why did that evoke such an emotional response from right. Milley? Right. Why? Why did he? This is a four-star general. Why did Why did Stephen Miller, who <laughs> I think, as if, to say it nicely, he's not exactly an intimidating guy, right, in person, Um you know, why does why does his comment evoke such an angry, insipid and and snippy response from Millie? It's because that information threatens his entire worldview. That information causes a cognitive dissonance spike in his mentality that shudders his entire body through a physical, a physical reaction. You can see the same uh, as he's walking with President Trump on the square of Lafayette Square Park in, on the north side of the White House after they've uh, removed the rioters and they're going out there in a show of force to show that the American president and the American system will not be intimidated, right? That was the point of that. But you can see Millie's face um, as he's walking there in his, his ill-fitting uniform, um, <laughs> that he's, he's looking distressed, he's giving side eye, he's looking around. He later does this huge apology for it because he knows that he is a man of the new regime and the new regime is not allowed right, to admit these things exist because to live in the new regime requires you to adhere to a series of lies, deceits, and falsehoods that have all been carefully erected to prevent you from admitting 
that the actual truth, right, the actual reality exists. The rise in crime, that's gun. But there's always an answer for everything, right? The rise in crime, that's guns. That's the NRA. You have to go after the NRA, right? Um, the rise of Antifa, well, they're just responding to racism. They're responding to white people. Um, the the January 6th, well, that was an insurrection. That wasn't people who were just wanted to have a, you know, a redress of grievances against the government that got out of hand. No, 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 no. That has to be the worst thing in the world. And everything that happened throughout 2020 was just localized protests. I mean, you could easily turn that around and say, well, January 6th was just one building, right? Well, no, 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 no. This was the worst thing that's ever happened in American history. Forget about 9-11. Forget about uh, the Boston bombing. Forget about Oklahoma City. Forget about the Civil War. No, no, no. This, this, and this alone, right? Because again, these are the lies that you're required to tell yourself to be able to survive in the new regime. And this is a guy who has spent his entire life in the bureaucracy of the United States military, his entire adult life, and he has survived by repeating every single piece, every single plank of the new regime's platform that's been handed to him. He's taken them, he's subsumed them, he's internalized them. But when he's lashing out at Miller right there, it's actually quite interesting to me, the psychology of it, because that's his conscience, actually. That's mm -hmm. his internal understanding of what is true and what is not true. And he knows that what Miller is saying is true. And he can see with his eyes what's actually happening. But because he's imposed so much of the false reality on him, he knows that he can't accept it. So he's actually not fighting against Stephen Miller. He's fighting against himself. First of all, Stephen Miller, if you're out there, I'd love to talk to you on the show. It's been hard to get in touch with him. Uh, he seemed to always be bringing the red pills everywhere that he went. And that one time that he did the press conference was amazing. was amazing. I wish we had seen well, more. Remember, of right, go, going back to that, just the, the formulation of what is a red pill, what is a blue pill? I think a lot of people um, mistake that for thinking red is Republican, blue is Democrat. No, no. not at all. No. Blue means you continue to exist in the false reality Red means your eyes are opened to actual reality. That is the point of a red pill, that you cut through, right? You cut through those layers and layers, of what do they call it? Crit the critical lens, right? The critical, no, you, you take away from that. And, you know, Cyril Pharrell in, uh, in the first book of um, A Game of Thrones, see with your eyes, Arya, see with your eyes. Mm. Interesting way to go, way to way to way to call back and close the loop on all of it by coming back. To I actually didn't. I didn't mean to do that. It just uh, it just actually kind <laughs> it of just came I was, out. I was blowing. It's I was blowing, man. I was blowing. It's authentic, Jack. It's authentic. Now, uh, com combine the complete takeover. Well, at least of the military leadership uh, by this desire to survive within the new regime. Combine that with Biden and. and by Certainly not the first time a new regime has targeted the military for purchase <laughs> immediately upon takeover. Of course, you have to target the military first. Again, this is completely historical. Right. But combine that with Biden's comments about <clears throat> the blood of patriots being brought to American soil by our own domestic F-15s and nuclear bombs. Um, I'm getting a little bit concerned. Uh, who's standing up for us, man? Like... How did this happen? Like, I'm thinking of General Patton, right? And now we're talking about General Milley, Mr. Blue Pill. And like, how did we, how did that happen? And what's here to protect us right now? If not going to be Second Amendment, if not going to be the military, if not going to be the Senate or the Congress or the universities or the media, Who's looking out for us? How did how did the military get here? If it's any different than what we've been talking about, and then who's you looking know what's out interesting? for us? I saw, I saw a comment on uh, on Twitter the other day, and people people say, "Oh, you know, Poso, you, you never, never read the comments, never respond to anybody." People <laughs> ask questions all the time. Well, actually, I do. I do read the comments. I do look a lot. Um, not again. You know, I get I get a lot, so I can't read all of them. But this one said, "Just wait for the cavalry to arrive." And, I'm, and I was looking at this person, I couldn't tell it was an anonymous account who it was or what their background was at all. And I, I kept thinking, wait for who? Wait, wait, wait for who? Th this is it, right? This is us. So it's either we stand up now 
and we stand together and we stand strong and use peace, always use peace. When I saw those people, those parents in Loudoun County standing up for their children, standing up for their rights and singing the Star Spangled Banner as they were arrested, right? When you think that we live in a time where the Star Spangled Banner has become a dissident anthem, right? It is a dissident anthem and the red, white, and blue has become a dissident flag, right? Understand what point in the story you're in, right? Understand what point in the story you're in. That's the time when you need to go out there. It's not about politics. It's not about left, right. It's about up, down, who has power, who doesn't. Where do we want to go as a society? Do we want to go down this path of the new morals, or do we want to go back to traditional American values. And that's a phrase that I'm going to start using and I'm I'm going to continue to start using, continue to say it, traditional American values. And you can go back, you know, my own, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm a Catholic. And so that definitely, you know, and again, I, you know, I wear my biases on my sleeve, right? I'm a Catholic. But when I look at Thomas Aquinas and his writings of the Summa Theologica, where he's combining, right, he's combining Aristotelian philosophy with theological values, faith, charity, right? That's what he's attempting to do is he's building upon the classics of Western civilization and then adding the theological element. So he's not denying all of this that came before us and trying to impose something new, right? He wants to make it all fit. But this new morality, right? The new imposition of the new moral regime in addition to the new political regime wants to throw that all out the window. And that's what got us to where we are today as society. And what's interesting about American society is that in the past, uh, we do try to be more egalitarian, right? You know, and obviously that's not possible in 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 the physical world, in the, in because because you know Hobbes was right about these sorts of things, um, and Aristotle was right about these sorts of things as well. People are different. People have different talents, but. You know, why did the United States not incur a massive revolution following um, the industrial age, right? The same way that Europe did with communism, with totalitarianism, fascism, uh, uh, experience this as well. Obviously, why did the U.S. not go through that? Because we traditionally as a society have looked at these or methods that kind of temper these pressures when, you know, when our Gini coefficient, when, you know, the haves have too much and the have nots have too little, that we have kind of found ways to sort of balance things out. And you can see that in the progressive era. You can see that with the rise of unions. You can see that with labor laws being passed. I'm talking about the original ones, not as they are currently constituted in many of these cases. They've become so corrupted. Um, but that was the point of Teddy Roosevelt. That was the point of Teddy Roosevelt as a conservative Republican coming up and saying, we need to do something for the little guy. We need to do something for the guy who feels like the system is screwing him and leaving him out. That's the kind of situation we're in right now. And so, you know, I don't necessarily know if we have a Teddy Roosevelt who's somebody from that. And the Roosevelts, I mean, they talk about a one percenter, right? You know, he is from that gilded class coming down and saying no more. Right. We need no more of this. Um, but it is going to be, I believe, a coalition of working class, middle class people and probably some class traders at the top coming down and saying we cannot continue a lot to allow this to happen to the United States of America, because, number one, it is not morally right. But number two, it is not sustainable in any way. The managed decline of the United States will not happen on our watch. We do not want to impose that on our children and our children's children. Indeed, there will be no waiting for Godot around here by either me or you or anyone that follows us, Jack. I really appreciate that. You actually segued into my final question already, and I appreciate that. It says that we're on the same page. You mentioned being Catholic. I myself was born into a Catholic family. I've been to mass. I understand very surface level what it means to be Catholic. I was also bar mitzvahed as a kid. I was raised Jewish and Catholic. It was very interesting. But being both of those, I didn't pick, nothing stuck, nothing stuck. And then in my 20s, I was probably a super cringy military atheist. Thank God I've grown out of that. And today I'm noticing that every part of my life is a 12 out of 10. But there's still 
something missing, something tying it all together. I think someone described it as a God-shaped hole. And I have been looking, I've been looking, I've been searching, I've been exploring, I've been really open to tradition, open to a notion of God. In fact, just today and yesterday, I've been reading about uh, St. Thomas, and I've been reading about these connections between Aristotle and God and the way he translated that for everyone and how powerful that was. And I wanted to ask you about your Catholicism and your religion and your spirituality. How does that affect your day-to-day -day activity? What, what energy does that give you? How does it help you? What is that meaning like in your life, Jack? Because I, I want that. That's one reason why I decided to ask my long-term girlfriend to get married. We want to invite God into our relationship and commit to something bigger. And so I think I'm taking baby steps, uh, if you could call marriage a baby step. Uh, but uh, just can you just talk to me a little bit about your 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 spirituality, how it how it works with you in your life today, and what what role do you see for it in America? I'm talking to Sorab Amari next week, so I know where he comes down. Great guy. Great I know guy. where he comes down on this. But tell me just a little bit about your personal experience and and how does it work for you, and what do you see for it uh, as an as our nation, as it relates to tradition well, yeah. and spirituality as such. You know, this is something that the founders talked about in the sense that our constitution doesn't work without a moral backbone, right? Without a moral fiber of the nation. And you largely had that at the time of the founding. Um, you, you, spiritually speaking, sure, there are, there are various groups of, as now as a Catholic, I would say there's a, various groups of Protestants out there, but um, you know, there was religious pluralism, but it was generally Christian, right? It was a generally Christian founding, uh, largely Protestant. And so at the time, um, the the morals, yes, there's differences of doctrine in terms of um, the various Protestant groups, but in terms of the, at least at that time, the moral underpinnings of it, this was this was all straight. Now this that that has been clearly corrupted, not only in terms of Protestantism, but also in terms of many of the Catholic um, Catholic churches, Catholic parishes. Um, Catholic institutions, and so you you do see these splits. You see a con there's sort of a conservative church, and there's some there's certain rites and certain groups of of priests and parishes that are that ascribe to this more conservative doctrinaire version, right, of the writings and of the teachings and of the traditions. And then you see this other church, and you see this in, in progressive Christianity, most pronounced, but. Um, just wants to go with the times that wants to take on whatever worldly um, hot button issues that there are and always be kind of pushing those and jumping ahead, jumping forward. And, you know, there's this, there's this thing where I actually was in uh, down in Miami and we went to this church It's called Yezu church, which is the oldest church in Miami. It's built late 18, 1800s. And uh, Miami's not actually not that old of a city. Um, it was it was mostly just like swamps and marshes until about the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. But this church is there, and there's a Cuban priest speaking. And he said, "You know, you can't go to these churches that only talk about the mercy of God and the love of God, right? He is merciful, and he is loving, but you cannot escape the judgment of God and the judgment aspect. And one thing that we teach in Catholicism." that to call out sin to admonish the sinner right is an act of spiritual mercy right it's an act of spiritual mercy to admonish the sinner this is when people say oh the you know the church wants to punish biden by denying him communion right this is the big uh issue with the catholic church right now i say no you don't get it it is an act of mercy because he is living in a public break or what we would call a schism right he is schismatic with church doctrine he is publicly denying the doctrine of the church and then potentially being a role model for others to deny that teaching as well and because of that public schism with church teaching that is the reason for the public admonishment as an act of mercy because we pray for him to return to that tradition and so uh, when thomas talks about this he says that our theology and our faith give us not only foundation in life but also purpose so Thomas writes that life is kind of like, it's sort of like a boomerang, right? We, we start with God, then we're thrown out into the world all on our own by ourselves. And that life's journey is a journey of returning to God. But then the interesting question is, well, how do we do that, right? Does that just mean going to church? Does that mean you know, become a monk and you, and you do all the time? 
what Thomas says, and he's, he's drawing from Aristotle on this because Aristotle was doing what? He was studying the human condition, right? And this is something that definitely concerns theologians as well as philosophers, that in the human condition, you have the situation of, yes, we are prone to, prone to sin, man has fallen, right? We are prone to uh, base desires, primal desires, but we also have talents and skills and abilities. And so, and Aristotle, of course, goes at length and Plato builds on this later talking about uh, what, where should people put those and how should people categorize themselves, et cetera. But what Thomas talks about is he takes a step further and says, those talents are a form of potentiality that God has given us when we're born, right? So you're first born, you have that potentiality and that what God wants you to do, and Jesus talks about this in the parable of the talents, he wants you to use those talents, grow them to their fullest fullest actualization. And so as you grow as a person, as you become fully formed and fully realized and fully actualized as a person, if you are doing that in a true moral sense while walking on that moral path, you are actually following the path back towards God that he's laid out for you. That's Thomas Aquinas. I like that, Jack. Thank you for giving me that bit. I'm reading so Rab's book right now. Is God Reasonable was the most recent chapter that I read, using reasoning to get back to God. Uh, there was a part of me that always thought that uh, you couldn't have reason and God at the same time. I'm actually learning that's quite different. And uh, I appreciate your conversation, your steadfastness and your publicness with your faith. It's an inspirational. It's leadership. I appreciate it. I get the feeling it's it's something that we I all need. I don't know how I could go up against some of this stuff without, you know, without, you know, I go to church every week and because we've, we've, we kind of church shopped a little bit. We found a great parish, a good traditional parish. And I, I feel energized when I go to church. It doesn't feel like a, uh, like a commitment or it doesn't feel like an obligation. I go in there and say, oh, thank God. Thank God I'm, I'm with the body of Christ. Thank God I'm with people who, you know, who look at this, that know how sinful modern life is and, and the world is and know that we are, you know, they say, what's, what's the holiest part of mass? And it's the end, right? It's actually the very end, right? So, certainly we have the, the Eucharist, but the part of mass where they says, go forth and spread the good news. You are given a mission right? That's not one hour where you go in there and you say, oh, this is nice. And here's, you know, this little sacrifice and that's good. And God's great. He's awesome. Look at these paintings. Oh, that's great. He did that for us. No, 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 no. You're getting your marching orders, right? And I say that as a, a former military guy, but you're getting your marching orders to go out there, spread this news, be that beacon of morality and hope and truth in the world because the world's always going to be the way the world is right that's that's the way it is you're not, not going to change that no matter no matter how much the progressives and the postmodernists and um you know they're they're i always try to say they they're um you know they're just atheists trying to run away from nihilism um because they don't know how to co how to uh you know how to balance the two or how to um you know, make it compatible they can't they can't agree uh, on it so um, I said, no, that, that God-shaped hole will always be there until you realize what's really going on behind the scenes. Jack Posobiec, thank you so much. Congratulations on your success. Congratulations on the positive influence you're having on the country. Congratulations on the book coming out. Congratulations on your beautiful family, Jack. Everybody out there, Jack is truly role model. Pay attention to what he's doing. I'm sure you all follow him already. By the way, special thank you to Jack Posobiec for giving me that not so subtle push over a hundred thousand on Twitter. I really appreciated that. That you day. remember that? You oh, remember that? Of course, I remember that. You took me from ninety three or whatever to like one fifteen in a day. You were like, "Oh, it's not going to be for another couple of days." I'm Months. calculating it out. You were yeah. like, "You were like doing long calculus, trying to yeah. figure it out." Yeah, I was trying. I was like, I predicted six weeks out from where it was, and you just did it in the next like 10 minutes. I do appreciate that. I appreciate all the super chats and everybody listening. And guys, the best way to spread this word is to share this interview, share this podcast, share the clips, share the audio podcast, share the YouTube video, hit the like button, hit the share button, hit retweet, do all the things because there's no question. People don't want us to get the word out. So help us, as Jack said, spread the good news. Jack Pitsoba, congratulations, folks. senior editor at Human Events. Thank you so much for coming on with me, Jack. I can't wait to do it again. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it, my friend. All right, we are out. Thanks, everybody. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. 
best people, the best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. 